Hello again doctors and welcome back to my channel. In this video we will be wrapping up our series on fungi with the cutaneous and subcutaneous mycoses covered on step 1. This includes the microbiology, pathology, and pharmacology. As always I will leave my sources listed down below as well as timestamps for where the info for each fungi begins. Now this one will be short and sweet so without further ado grab some coffee, get comfortable, and let's get started. Let's start off by categorizing these fungi, shall we? So the cutaneous and subcutaneous mycoses, which we are going over today, are markedly different from the rest of the fungi that we've gone over so far. First off, being that both of the categories are solely contained to the skin. Rarely, if ever, do they disseminate to the rest of the body. And secondly, being the fact that the cutaneous fungi are communicable from person to person, meaning that they are contagious. In fact, they are highly contagious. And now the subcutaneous fungi are spread via contact with spores, usually through trauma. This is totally different from the systemic or deep fungi and the opportunistic fungi because all of those, except candida, are respiratory pathogens because their route of entry is via inhalation. Some of them do, of course, have skin manifestations. However, those are secondary to their respiratory manifestations. The exception, of course, is candida which I will be going over right now because her primary pathologies are in the skin. And next, since we are talking about skin fungi, let's review a little bit of skin structure. There is, of course, the cutaneous and subcutaneous layers, aka the epidermis and the dermis. So let's zoom in on the epidermal layer. Now there are five layers, each starting with the word stratum. So let's omit that for a second. We have corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, and basale, each of which will be covered in later lectures on skin, but the mnemonic that I like to use to remember, there are two. The first one is corn lovers grow several bales, but the one I really like to use is come on, let's get sunburned. And now let's move on to their actual names. So we have dermatophytes and non-dermatophytes, and the dermatophytes being the epidermal feed-in family, microsporum, and trichophedon. And the non dermatophytes we have Candida, Malassezia forfor, Tinea nigra, and Black and White piedra. And the mnemonic that I used to get them in this order was EMTs can make treatment possible. Totally true, EMTs save lives just as doctors do. Now, what do they all have in common? All of them are confined to Shadum corneum, which is the first layer that we just went over. All of them have worldwide epi, and all can be treated with azoles, terbinafin, and griseofulvin by mouth or in a satin topically, or in a swish and spit form. If you haven't seen my antifungals video, I will link it below. And to start off, we're going to begin with the dermatophytes and all of the typical tinea presentations. Now, all of these rashes are associated with pruritus. It's important to remember is that they're itchy. They're all named for the location in which they appear on the body, so you would narrow them down by location first, and then by description of the actual rash. First up, we have tinea capitis, which occurs on the head and scalp. It's associated with hair loss in the affected areas, which differs from the rest because those are typically not found in parts of the body without having any hair. It's very common amongst wrestlers and other athletes. Otherwise, it happens mostly in kids and boys more than girls. Next up is tinea corporis, which happens on the torso, really, but it can occur anywhere on the body aside from the head, inguinal area, and feet. This one's easiest to tell, though, because of the description of the rash. It will be described as an arithmetic scaling ring with central clearing. So the infection actually starts off in the center and then radiates outward in the centrifugal pattern. And for any of you that know Spanish, cuerpo means body in Spanish, so that's how I used to remember corporis. goes with anywhere on the body. Next up is tinea cruris, which I used to think it was in a crurious area, aka the inguinal area, colloquially termed jock itch. Now you can distinguish this from corporis in the fact that this rash does not show central clearing. It's a confluent rash that actually mimics candidal intertrigo. So candida should be on your list of differentials, However, which we will go over after, that typically only occurs within the folds of the skin. Next up is tinea pedis, colloquially termed athlete's foot. Now there are three different patterns of distribution which I have written there as well as a picture. The only thing I will mention is that some texts do say that you'd have to, you need to have a primary bacterial infection first in order for this fungi to superimpose itself on it. And finally, we have tinea unguinum, aka or nicomycosis, sorry for that typo. This refers to yellow nails of the hands or feet. Now, in clinical practice, this will be the most common that you are presented with. In my general rotations, I really didn't see a patient over the age of 50 that didn't have yellow toenails. 
Okay, and now onto the pathogens themselves. The reason why I started with the presentations is because that's typically what you're going to be tested on, that and the treatment. The actual descriptions of these fungi are not heavily tested unless you are in microbiology because diagnosis is typically on clinical exam. You can do a skin scraping or KOH uh, wet prep, and you will, of course, observe the hyphae, but again, typically the diagnosis is made by clinical presentation. So going in order, EMT, the first order we have is epidermophidin, which only have macro canidia, which are typically described as looking like a beaver's tail. Next up is microsporum, which, of which there are many species that I don't have listed there. What you need to know is that they all both have micro and macro canidia, and you can perform a wood lamp test or a hair perforation test in order to distinguish it from epidermophidin and trichophidin, and this one is urease positive. Now, trichophidin room room, this is the one that you probably should remember. It's the most common cause of the tinnias. This one has septate true hyphae, and its microcanidia are described as birds on a lane. Now, on Saberaris agar, it will be described as having fuzzy white mycelias, and this one is negative for all of the other tests. No woods lamp, no fluorescence, and no urease. And now just for a quick recap, remember these are named in terms of their location. Trichophidin room room is the most common cause and probably the only one you should remember. Always rule out a bacterial or candidal infection first. Candidal infection would have to be ruled out by KOH, but bacterial causes would either have pruritus or general inflammatory signs, so redness, swelling, heat, etc. And now really importantly, the treatment options. Now you can use topicals or by mouth azoles. If the patient's still not responding, you can try terbinafin. And if the patient's still not responding, you can try griseofulbin. Terbinafin and gris are both by mouth. However, griseofulbin is never first line because of all of its negative side effects. Check out my antifungals video. And next up, we have Candida albicans. Now, she is a commensal flora of our mucosa, so she has an inherent tropism there. And she cannot survive in a pH greater than 4.5, and she cannot alter the pH of her environment. Now, she typically causes superficial infections. However, she is in my opportunistic fungi video, which I will have linked at the end. Today, we're only going to talk about her superficial infections. Those include oral thrush, diaper rash, and vaginitis. Morphologically, this fungus is dimorphic, but really she is polymorphic. On scraping and KOH prep at 20 degrees, you will see budding yeast with pseudohyphae, which is the buzzword, budding yeast with pseudohyphae. Confirmatory test is the germ tube test, which is at 37 degrees, cultured in serum. Germ tubes is just the beginning formation of a hyphae. And for viral factors, of which she has many, she forms a thick biofilm. Her hyphal form actually is what allows for tissue penetration and escaping phagocytosis. She is a sideral form, meaning that she can, uh, she has the machinery to acquire iron from her host, and she is catalase positive, giving our patients with chronic granulomatous disease an increased risk. Now for the two pathologies we are going over, there are two sets of risk factors. The first being babies, our elderly patients, and the patients with obesity for intertrigo. Secondly, for vulval vaginitis, we have females that are on OCPs, antibiotics, or diabetics. We had to recap the key points. Remember, Candida can't survive in a pH above 4.5. In the cold, she shows budding yeast with pseudohyphae, and in the heat, she forms germ tubes, and the risk factors for the two pathologies heavily rely on the patient's past medical history. We will start off the pathologies with intertrigo, which is an inflammatory reaction within the folds of the skin, because conditions favor breakdown like moisture, heat, and friction. Those at risk are infants and elderly patients using diapers, it is a complication of morbid obesity, as well as vitamin B6 deficiency. Important thing to note is that secondary bacterial infections are common with streptococci or Carinobacterium species. One pertinent differential, just as far as clinical presentation, is called a skin syndrome. However, that's an exfoliating pathology, and you will see blistering throughout the entire body. It won't be localized to one area. Secondly, we have vulval vaginitis, colloquially termed yeast infection. Now, in general, the, the risk factors are any disruption of the natural pH balance of the vagina. So in your female patients of reproductive age, if they are on antibiotics, advise them to eat a yogurt once a day in order to replace some of that good bacteria and yeast. The symptoms will be an itchy red vulva with or without a thick, sticky, white cottage cheese-like discharge, and it's very common to occur just before a female enters her menstruation cycle. Now I have the list of differentials there, which will be covered later on in my parasite lectures and bacteria lectures. However, in general, you can narrow this down by the odor and the color of the discharge. Diagnosis would be on vaginal swab with a KOH wet prep, where you will of course see budding yeast with pseudohyphae, and the pH on the dipstick will be less than 4.5. Treatment options for intertrigo include oral fluconazole and topical mystatin, 
as well as keeping the area clean and dry. Similarly, for a yeast infection, we can use oral fluconazole and avoid the risk factors. And for our next pathogen, we have Melasesia for four, who is actually a skin commensal because she feeds on long chain fatty acids. She's more commonly pathogenic in hot or humid climates or in those who sweat heavily. Risk factors include contraceptive use as well as immunosuppression, malnutrition, as well as total parenteral nutrition. Most importantly, the morphology on investigation, a KOH web prep, prep you will see short hyphae and spores with the typical spaghetti and meatballs appearance. And on wood lamps, you will see a copper-orange fluorescence. Melasesia's pathology is called pityriasis versicolor. This is one of the main reasons why I like to split them up from dermatophytes and non-dermatophytes, because this one is also sometimes referred to as tinea versicolor. Starting off with the pathogenesis, it of course is spread by contact. She can produce azelaic acid, which has a bleaching effect on the skin, as well as phenolic compounds that inhibit tyrosinase. That, of course, will prohibit the synthesis of melanin. She also produces melanocyte damaging compounds via lipid degradation. Don't forget, she feeds on lipids. Now, the clinical presentation, this is completely asymptomatic, completely differing from our actual tinnias, which are itchy. It's a confluent fine scaly rash that tends to hypopigment darker people and hyperpigment lighter people. And for infantile pneumonia, I will link an NCBI article down in the description because recent studies have shown that especially premature neonates on TPN with lipid infusion are at risk for malassezia pneumonia. The most pertinent differential is vitiligo, which you can rule in or out by past medical history or comorbid autoimmune diseases. And for investigation, of course, we do KOH prep where we see these spaghetti and meatballs or under woods lamps, she will fluoresce copper orange. And for treatment options besides the azoles, topical and oral, you can use selenium sulfide shampoo, which is over-the-counter as Selsin Blue and Head and & Shoulders. And our next non dermatophyte is Tinea nigra, with the etiology being Cladosporum or Neckii. He's most prevalent in the southern U.S. and in tropical regions. He contains a melanin-like pigment in its hyphae, ca causing the clinical presentation as brown, hyperpigmented spots on the palms and soles. This is the only fungal pathology that can occur there on the palms and soles. And don't forget your viral and bacterial causes, the Kars mnemonic, Coxsackie A, Rickettsia, and Syphilis. Investigation, of course, is KOH prep, and the inlet on the right is what you would see. And for treatment, you can either use over-the-counter salicylic acid or, again, selenium sulfide shampoo. And finally, to round out our subcutaneous fungi, we have black and white piedra. The etiology for black piedra is P. hortae and trichosporin ovoides, typically found in humid, wet, tropical areas. For white piedra, it is the entire trichosporin genus, found in semi-tropical to temperate climates. Now, these two fungi are both found in the soil, and the KOH preps that you see in the inlets are actually their nodules formed around the hair shaft. So this one is contained in the hair. Once those nodules grow large enough, they release their fruiting bodies into the air, fall into the dirt, and the cycle repeats. Now, the genus Trichosporin, do not confuse it with Trichophetin rumbrum from our actual tinnias. The presentation is completely asymptomatic. It's not even itchy. The only thing it will cause is weakness and breakage of the hair. So it's very hard to diagnose, and it's even harder to treat. Ideally, wax the area, and you can use terminophen by mouth, but treatment takes weeks. And now on to our last two pathogens, which are our subcutaneous fungi. Starting off with Sporothrix shunkii, who is introduced to the body via penetrating trauma. Now, she lives on things like rose thorns and tree bark, and she is dimorphic. Now, the risk factors are events that would expose you to things like tree bark, like gardening, carpentry, splinters, thorns, things like that. There is evidence of zoonotic transmission with horses, sheep, cats, and rodents. And the fact that cats are on that list and the clinical presentation that cat scratch disease should be on your list of differentials with Bartonella hensley. The clinical presentation is sporotrichosis, aka rose gardener's disease. It begins as small red pustules, which spreads along um, ascending lymphatics, aka an ascending lymphangitis. Now over time, the distal lesions begin to ulcerate and drain, and secondary bacterial infections are extremely common. There are other rare presentations like in the lung and in the bone, which I will not go over. On investigation, this is the most important part, her morphology. On biopsy of the affected tissue, you will see granulomas with histiocytes, mononuclear cells, and huge cigar-shaped yeasts. 99% of the time you get a question, that's going to be the answer, or this clue will be in the vignette, cigar-shaped yeasts. On KOH prep, they describe it as a floweret arrangement of conidia, seen in the mold phase with 
branching hyphae. Treatment options, of course, are the azoles by mouth, namely itraconazole, and potassium iodide is an archaic method of treatment, but is sometimes still tested. So to recap, don't forget, cigar-shaped yeasts, rose gardener's disease from a rose thorn, and it is an ascending lymphangitis. And finally, the last one on our list, we have chromoblastomycosis, the etiology being dermatiaceous fungi, whose canidia are dark gray or black, most commonly found in the tropics, and it's introduced on bare legs or feet and through pre-existing trauma or abrasions. The clinical presentation is kind of similar to sporotrichosis in that there's a slow growing lesions with crusting abscesses that extend along the lymphatics. The difference here is sporotrichosis is usually on the upper limbs and chromoblastomycosis is usually on the lower limbs and it's much more exaggerated. Confirmation would be on biopsy and you would see large dark brown spherical chromo bodies with leukocytes or giant cells. Treatment as with most of these is extremely long with antifungals by mouth, plus usually local surgery. Okay, doctor, you've made it to the end, not only of this video, but if you've been keeping up with the rest of my videos, this is the last installment of my fungal series. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you stay tuned to my channel. I plan on doing parasites next. Good luck studying, and I, of course, will see you on the next one. Start.